The following is a presentation of Nachi Creek Baptist Church in Madisonville, Tennessee. For more information, please visit nachicreekbaptist.org.
myself fast. My heart was beating right now. You'd start praying a little bit early. Uh, I'm going to break the, break the cardinal sin of trying to do something you shouldn't do, and that's introduce somebody. Because once you start, there's, there's other people that you uh, should be bringing up to. I see so many people here that's come this morning that uh, I'm just special proud that you've come. I'd like to introduce this morning a couple of people, seriously. Uh, my daughter's come down, like he said, uh, she's from City Co, and, and their revival is starting this morning. The pastor that was to preach that revival this morning died from brain aneurysm, just dropped over, just like that. So if you think that you're promised tomorrow, maybe you should read over in First Samuel where it says that you're just a heartbeat away from death. You don't know. So you pray for City Co Baptist Church this morning. Shannon, if you stand, this is my daughter, and, and I'm just real proud of her, and, and I've asked her to come this morning for a special reason. Uh, then I have my first cousin from Maryville, Carolyn Brewer, that's sitting beside Shannon, and I'll not ask you to stand and embarrass you, Carolyn, but I'm tickled to death that you want to come down and hear your old first cousin preach. Uh, then I have two special guests, or three special guests I'd like to introduce to you. This is a man that uh, all of you know I deer hunt a lot and, and uh, at least some land over in Middle Tennessee. The old man that I leased from was Coolidge Wilkerson. Coolidge and I have become very, very dear friends. And uh, I was telling Larry, his son's here this morning, Larry Wilkerson, and Kathy, his wife, and Collins, their grandson. And I'm so proud that they've drove over from nearly from Nashville around Carthage area where they live. He's a CPA over there and, and a very respected man. He was ordained as a deacon just a while back. I went over to be with him in his ordination service. And I appreciate from the bottom of my heart, Larry, you and Kathy driving that distance just to hear an old country boy try to preach. Uh, I'm not the big preacher that can stand and fluently preach, but uh, God did call me to preach, uh, to evangelize. I'm a souped up cheerleader is all I am because I can't uh, preach like Gail and some of the big preachers, but I can tell you what God done for me and what he's done in my life. And uh, so Coolidge passed away and Inez passed away and, and Larry is taking me under his wing and just been so nice to me over there and they come over and we shared a couple of days, went to Lost Sea last night. And John and Karen, I don't know where you're at, you're normally sitting right down here, there they are. Uh, your daughter, uh, we went to Lost Sea and she was our guide and, and man, she cracked me up. I, I laughed all day. She is precious. I didn't know the girl that good, but we just had a good time together. And, uh, you know, friends are, friends are dear. And he is ordained as a deacon. He's a, he's a godly man and his dad was a godly man and that means a lot to me. But Larry is, you know, I, when Cooley's died and Larry sort of was taken over and then I was leasing it from Larry and dealing with him, I really didn't know that much about Larry. And so I was over in Carthage one day and eating dinner at a, at a small restaurant over there. In Carthage, like Massonville, most things are small over there. And so I sat down beside the old gentleman and was talking. He said, you from around here? I said, no, I'm from over in uh, East Tennessee. And uh, he said, uh, what are you doing over this part by my ass? And I said, well, I'm over here deer hunting. And uh, he said, oh, that's good. There's a lot of people deer hunting on. I said, I, I hunt over on uh, Coolidge Wilkerson's uh, farm. You know it? He said, oh, Lord, yeah, I've known Coolidge all my life, and I know is, and, and sorry about Coolidge passing away. I said, yeah, I was honored to be one of his pallbearers. I really thought the world of him. Spent a lot of time uh, with him under a wagon one day, and he told me about when he got saved and got after him, and we had a good time. He was dear to me. I said, oh, Larry, he's a pretty good boy, ain't he? I, didn't, I don't really know Larry that, that much. And he said, oh, yeah, Larry's a fine boy. He said, he's been a Christian, Christian guy ever since I've known him, and I've known him real, real good. We're close friends. And uh, I think his name was John. I'm not for sure. He said, uh, Larry was telling me one time uh, some things about his life, and he said, I just knew by that one thing that he had to be really devoted to God because he was telling me that he'd found a girl that he thought was going to be the dream of his life named Kathy. And he said he was telling me about uh, when he met her and how he fell and just fell head over heels in, in, in for her. And said, uh, he said, recently, he said, I'm just, just, I'm just dying to hold her and kiss her. And, and he said, I really would like to balance everything I do by God's word. If it's not in that scripture, then I'm not going for it. I don't care how bad, you know. 
And he said, uh, I got to thank him back. He said, he went home, he was telling me this. And, and uh, he said, I was looking through the Bible, trying to find something to make it all right for me just to squeeze her real good and get me some sugar. And he said, uh, I couldn't find anything in God's Word. So finally, I kept reading over there and said, uh, I greeted, uh, I found that verse that said, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, I don't know if you've noticed me, a lot of times when I walk down here to Sharon, Sharon is my baby. I love her to death. We greet each other just like it's right here. That's called a holy kiss. I love you. I love you too, Laura. Nothing wrong with it. It's a brotherly love, holy kiss. So Larry went on and he said, I've got it right there. I can use that. Greet each other with a holy kiss. And, and I, I can get it. He said, called her and got a date with her and they went out to eat. And he said, they hurried home. And she was expecting to go on to a movie or something. She said, I couldn't wait to get home because I knew there at the door, you usually, you know, kiss them goodnight. And I couldn't wait. My heart was beating fast. I said, I, I walked her to the door, and there she was in front of that white house and that rose terrace and those pretty red roses and that golden hair, and she was so pretty. And I said, I'm just sitting here, my heart's beating fast, and I think, finally, here's the time. I'm going to get to squeeze my, my true love here. And, and maybe get to kiss her goodnight. And he said, I started toward her, and he said, about that time God spoke to me, and he said, Larry, you can't use that verse, read each other with a holy kiss, because that's nothing to do with, with a romantic kiss. That's talking about a spiritual application. That's talking about that we should greet each other with a holy kiss and, and love each other, one as another, doing to others. That, that's where that's coming from, Larry. And Larry just, oh, man, just mailed it. I mean, right there. Oh, no, all this time I thought I was finally going to, Lee and I was finally going to get to hold her in my arms and maybe give her a kiss, you know, and sweet, sweet. And he said, I just down my head and nailed it. And said, about that time, Kathy grabbed him and she turned him around, slammed him up against the house, and there Larry said, you know, those roses and his old black hair, he was looking real cute. And said, boy, here she comes. She come at me and said, she started kissing me and she kissed and she kissed and she kissed some more and said, what are we doing all that kissing? said, I pulled back from her, and I said, Kathy, have you got any scripture for this to make this all right for us to kiss like this? She said, I sure do. And he said, well, what is it? She said, do unto us, or you'd have them to do unto you. <laughs> <coughs> you noticed I walked out of the pulpit to tell her this way. <coughs> but we should greet each other with a holy kiss. We should love one another. I was sitting here this morning, I was telling Larry about how there's usually three or 400 people here, the choir is completely full, not a seat in it, how they roar, and I never seen them like a long face in my life. I reckon when the pastor goes, everybody goes with him, and the ones that's left behind is left for just this morning lost if they ain't here. This is not the way Notch Creek usually is. Usually these people flooding that altar, and, uh, and God comes in a holy way. Man, we've got one of the best churches in the world. I'm proud of it, and I am tickled to death that you are here this morning because there's a lot of people that's not here, but you cared enough to come. So I appreciate you coming, and I appreciate you all driving over and being so faithful to come and support me and Carolyn. You know I love you. So this morning, if you'll uh, turn to Matthew's Gospel, the 26th chapter, I'd like to preach a sermon called... Uh, lasting and dying commitment and some point in your life you might do what i done and that's turn to god and say i'm tired of playing games i'm tired of coming to church and giving you one hour of my life and calling it quits i might come to sunday school and give you two hours but that's all i need i just need to make an appearance there's some people that comes on sunday morning and will never be back on sunday night and never experience what gail does on sunday night he preaches better on Sunday night than he does Sunday morning. The Spirit's here. It's just a good, homely feel. But some people never make it back because they never have made a lasting and dying commitment to make God the Lord of their life. The Lord is, in Webster, is defined as one that rules over completely. And if God is not the Lord of your life, if you're not given all of it, I, I was watching on television one day and I, I passed by this channel and it was a poker plan. And I, I thought, you know, that's not the way we played poker when I was a kid, and I was caught up in the devil's way and, and did play poker. But they had this expression, all in. I mean, every bit of it, everything I got, it's all in. I'm going, I'm going for the whole mother load, man. I'm, I'm investing everything I've got. Well, that was one time in my life that I had to say, all in. I had to change my life, and I had to quit coming to the altar and pushing it under there and getting rid of the 
the guilt key. And, and you do. God forgives you, and, and he said he would. And you feel better. But then the same person don't show back up for Sunday night service. And I can't understand it. How you can take a righteous God that died on a cross for you, loved you so much, and not care enough to come back. And then on Wednesday night, what, 30, 40 people? Nothing like Sunday morning, Sunday night. People, we've got to make a lasting and dying commitment to let Jesus Christ be the Lord of our lives. Saying, all in, Father, I'll give it all. I know what you did when you went to the cross. Shannon, if you don't care, come up here just a moment. I, I've asked her to come and help me with something that I can't do alone. She's my baby. This is my girl. I can remember her out by the pool and her mama's dressed, a brown one, Shannon, when you was all made up and uh, playing, and she was so cute. I was looking at a picture of you the other night and how sweet you was and all. And I've always thought Shannon was a pretty girl. Some people say that you look just like me. <laughs> the most of them say you look like your mother, though. But I think she's precious. She's my baby. And I told you if you hung around me, I'd make a star of you. I'd put you on the big screen, though. So you're there, and I wouldn't dream of you being a star any place besides right here in God's church. I want to tell you a story that touched my life like no other story has ever touched me, I don't think. It's got to do with a father when he took a trip in the old days. He would gather his children around, and he'd give them a blessing. And they had a thing that was called hands to the head. You'll turn around. The father would come and he'd take that kid and he'd put the hands to the head. And he would look at her hair and how pretty it was and how she looked. And he'd look at her eyebrows and he'd look at that. He'd look at her beautiful eyes and her nose and her lips. Her face is how pretty. And memorize everything about her. In case while he was on that trip that somebody would ask him, what's your kids look like? It would be so fresh and so vivid. He could just say, well, she's got the prettiest little eyebrows. They, they curve around in her greenish blue eyes. And her, her blue eyes, she took after my dad. He was blonde head and blue eyes. And her hair is so pretty and her little sweet lips. I can remember when you was a baby and you kissed those sweet lips on my cheek and said, Daddy, I love you. And I can remember, honey, when you was a baby and your little precious hands would have a little difference. So, and I'd kiss them, each one, and I love them, and I'd put them up to my face. And they were so sweet. I can remember every little thing about you. And when people would ask them, what she look like? He'd come right back and he could tell them all about what she really looked like. And I can imagine the night that you got saved. We was over there in the old building I had just preached on when Jesus passes by. And I'd always told Shannon, I said, honey, if you ever need to get saved, come to me and let me, let me talk to you. I want to know that you really get to. And there were so many people coming that night that she couldn't get to me. And she got confused and we left. And <clears throat> we was going home and she started telling me there in that Toyota truck what, would ha what had happened. And I pulled over up at the association building, and we pulled in that parking lot. And I said, honey, you should have you got somebody else if you couldn't got to me. And she said, well, you all sit. And I said, well, honey, let's just pull over here. I, I wanted to go home and let Carolyn be in on her getting saved because I knew what was going to happen because she was under conviction. And she'd asked God. God said, I will save you if you ask, man. No strings attached. So I pulled in there in case some old drunk could swerve over and hit us and take her out of the world before she had a chance to get saved. But I don't think God would let that happen. But anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that chance. We pulled in there and I said, Shannon, honey, you pray. And I'm going to pray. But you make sure you ask Jesus to come to your heart. And after a while, she was praying. And she started crying. And I, I knew it was a happy cry. I knew it wasn't nothing wrong. And I knew what happened. I knew God would come to heart. I said, honey, what happened? She said, daddy, I got saved. I know I got saved. She said, I feel so good. And I said, honey, what did you say? 
And she said, Jesus, save me. Please. And when she said, please, I, I like to come out of that little tail. Because there ain't no God in heaven that would ever look down at a little girl looking up and saying, in her heart, I'm a sinner, I need you. Jesus, save me. I want you. I want heaven. I don't want hell. And when she come to the part, Pat, when she said, please, do you think God Almighty would ever say no? I can't. I had not got time right now to deal with you. You hadn't even read the Bible through. You hadn't done this. You hadn't done that. You hadn't been baptized. Just wait and go back and get a little bit better. No, God said, if you'll ask, I will save you. And that's what he did to my baby that day. And she got saved. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when Jesus went to that cross, I believe before he went, he said, I knew, I knew exactly how you looked. I seen your face. And because you're his, I believe with all my heart, he died for you and for me and every one of us. And she knows your face. Amen. It's prettier than him than it is in me. I love you. <laughs> I believe that with all my life. Let's read in the Gospel of Matthew 26. I'm going to start with the 40th verse if I can see it. Please excuse my reading. And it come unto the disciples, and finding them asleep, and said unto Peter, What would thou watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye might enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away the second time and prayed, saying, O Father, if this cup not pass away from me, Except I drink it, thy will be done. Frank Hicks preached in a revival at this podium right here, and he pulled out a cup. He's preached this revival message all over the lands. So powerful. I asked Frank, I said, that message touched my heart, and I'd like to use the part about the cup in a sermon that God's put on my heart. And there's something else you preached, and I'd like to use it too if you would give me permission. He said, I don't have the right to give you permission. It's God's sermon. I preached it. If it'll shoot it, that bullet will shoot your gun, put it in there and shoot it. But he preached about the cup. And when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knew that he was starting to undertake the cross, he knew what was ahead. Jeff, he had not sinned. He'd never sinned. He'd been tempted, but he'd never sinned. And he knew that on that cross he would hang there willingly because it was God's will. For God said, for God so loved the world, that being you and me, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not help me, perish. What's that mean? Total separation from God, that thou should not perish. He went there to take your sins because you are a sinner. I'm a sinner. My sins were in the cup. He looked at that cup and he said, Father, I don't want to partake of it. He knew that when he looked in that cup that he seen Calvary. He seen him hanging on the tree. He seen him being balked. He seen the spear that would go in his side. He seen the crown that would be put on his head and drove down with a reed into his head so the blood run down his face. He'd already been beaten beyond anything that a human being could stand. He did not die because it was not God's will for him to die at that point. And he went on through the whole thing and he knew that he would be hung there naked before the world. You take the most tender girl in this place and take her and take her clothes off and you can imagine the shame that would be on her. That same shame was on Jesus Christ because he was doing it and they was trying to disrobe him, to mock him, to shame him, to tear him down and say, yeah, you're the king. Why don't you call your angels in if you're the king? He didn't come to be a king that he would dictate and call in 10,000 angels. He could by raising his hand or speaking a word. But he did not. He come to be the king of your heart. And he come that you would accept him willingly. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Didn't say that you would be saved, that he'd force you to be saved. He said that I might, you might be saved. It's your free will. And it goes on to say that if you don't accept him, that you're condemned already. In other words, you made the decision to go to hell. You're saying, I don't want to go to heaven. I don't want to walk on streets of gold, walls of jasper, of pearl, holy angels running around and singing and praising God, and we won't be ashamed at that time, Colonel, to raise our hands. I have the awfulest time with that because I don't feel worthy to raise my hands. I know where I've been. I know where I've been. And I know what God's done for me, but I can't hardly get my hands up. I can get one up, but boy, I can't get two up to save my life. In heaven, you'll be proud to say, Father, thank you. Oh, God Almighty, thank you. Lord Jesus, praise your holy name. I wrote a poem that's talking about uh, all the things in heaven and all. And I said, when I get to heaven, I'll kiss his sweet face. Then, Oh, I just want to walk up to Jesus and say, thank you that you shared it. And I will just want to touch him and kiss his sweet face for all he's done for me. Because you see, when he went to heaven and hung on that cross and died for your sins, he looked into that cup. I don't know if you can see it, but he's seen your sins. And he said, I'm going to die for Keith because I love him so much. Your face is tender to me too, Keith. I love you. You're my son. Well, there's Doug Hopper's sins. Can you see them? Can you see the sins of Doug Hopper? All the things that Doug had said. Oh, honey, and your sins. Did you see them? God was seeing your sins. And he said, I'm willing to die for her. Oh, what a sweet face. That's my baby. I knew her before she was even conceived, before I even put her in her mother's womb. God loves you. God loves you so much that he was willing to take on your sins, not his sins, your sins, he was willing to take all of this because he loved you so much to provide you a way into heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except by me. And he said, one of these days I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I'll surely come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That was a promise. He said, I'm going away but I'm going to come back and get you. Mike, as you were teaching the other day, and you were talking about, I can almost see him coming. Man, I tell you, when the eastern skies breaks, Jeff, I'm going home. I've got my place in heaven. I've got my ticket. Carol and I were going by the airport one day. We were going to the UT ball game. I said, Carolyn, when we get up there, we've got to have a ticket to get in that bus to drive over from Ag County to over there to get out of that high paying parking. We get over there at the game, we're going to have to have a ticket, Larry. Everything you do, you've got to have a ticket. And I said, head over there at the airport. One of these days, there's going to be a plane take off. <laughs> there's going to be a heavenly fly fly out of here. And you're going to have to have a ticket. But you know the beautiful thing about this story? That ticket's done been bought. And it's done been paid for. You don't have to pay a dime. It's done been paid. It's purchased just for you just for you and God said do you want that ticket all you've got to do is come and call on my name for all that call on my name I will say he said you must be born again I've got your ticket do you want it all you've got to do is come and ask isn't that a hard thing to do old farmer was walking through the farm lot one day and the hay got on fire, the wheat, what, what did he call it? I don't know, it has been cut. And it, was, it just burned over. And he said he'd seen a rock there, he kicked it over. He said, Lord, it wasn't a rock. It was an old chicken. She laid that there and burned up. And that, he said, I thought that was peculiar. But he said, when I kicked her over, he said, I seen it wasn't a rock. It was a chicken. And that old mother chicken had spread her wings. And when she fell over, the little chicks run out. She covered those chicks, her babies. And she took the flames and the fire because she wanted her kids that she loved so much to, to live. And she took the flames and died that the chicks might live. That's what God done for you when he went to the cross. He said, I love you so much that I'll take the cup. 
And I'll drink the cup. I'll drink every bit of the sins just for you because I love you so much. I love you, Debbie. That's what he said. I love you in spite of your sins so much that I'm willing to drink it all. I'll take it all. I, I, don't you imagine he could feel the, the hurt of Calvary's nails going through his hand and, and the mockery and the, the hurt of all of it? Oh, I, I know that must have hurt Jesus a lot to realize that was what he was about to take. But most of all, we don't talk about this a whole lot in the Baptist church. The cross was just a little bit of what it was all about. Because when he looked into that cup, Kay, Dar, he not only seen your sins and the cross and the spear and the thorns and the mockery, he seen hell in the grave because he knew that he was to pay for those sins was going to go into hell for three days and take on your sins. He seen hell and all that was in hell and knowing that he was going there and knowing that his heavenly father had no desire to look upon sin which he would become because of you and because of his love for you. And when he went into hell for three days and took upon my sins and your sins, the father had to turn his back on his child because he couldn't look at him. And can't you imagine the passion, the, oh, the God, the, the hurt. Shannon, how would it hurt if I turned my back on you and wouldn't even look at you? Couldn't look at you because you was nasty and you were sinful. That's what God done for you. That's what God done for you. That's what God done for me. He turned his back on you and, and he felt destitute. He felt all alone. He felt the total separation of God because he loved you so much. That's what Jesus done for you. And he said, by doing all of this, it's over. It's finished. I done it all. And his father looked back on him as he arose from the grave and said, that's my son. He did what I asked him to do. I asked him to take on hell for the people that I created. Because I didn't want him to go to hell. I didn't create hell for you. I created hell for the devil and his angels because he separated from me and I kicked him out of heaven. And that was for the, for the devil. It was not created for you. And he said, I gave you a way. They had to be a way. And I gave you a way to get to me. It's your free will to accept him or reject him. If you've never been saved, the Bible, God's word, says you have chosen. I'm not sending you to hell. People say, oh, how could a righteous God, a loving God, send you to hell? I just can't see how a good God, a loving God, could send anyone to hell. He don't, my friend. He said, accept me where you don't have to go. He puts... The heaven in the Bible 725 times if I'm not off the top of my head and he spoke of hell 50, 55, something like that. Far more about heaven. That's, that's what he had on his mind. He wanted you to go to heaven where it was all good. He did not want you to go to hell that was created for the devil and angels. He gave you a way out by sending his son into torment for you. For your sins if you'd only accept him. Well you say what do I have to do to be saved? The Bible says in Romans, he said, anyone that will call upon my name shall be saved. No ifs, nans, and buts about it. He does not say, Shannon, you'll have to go back and read your Bible all the way through. I like to I never got that book read all the way through, Pat. I'm a sorry reader. But I started up there when I was climbing poles, and we'd take our dinner there, and I was dead. And months before that, I was out in sin. That was before I made that lasting and dying commitment and said, God, you've got the rest of my life. I'm changing the way I'm going. I'm turning from this way and I'm going that way for the rest of my life. And I made a lasting and dying commitment. I said, I'm going to change. And I said, I'm going to pick up God's Word and I'm going to read some of it. I've never read a book in my life. I can't read good. I don't like to read. Kathy and Carol sat out there and talked about reading for two days at the house. And I thought, boy, how exciting is that? I don't like to read. I never did even read comic books. 
I don't even read deer hunting books. Believe it or not. But I got over there and I said, I'll find me a little short book. And I got over there, First John. <laughs> I turned right to First John. How about that? A real short book. Second John, Third John. But boy, it's all about God's Word. Don't you see all that red <laughs> underline? And I like them good parts where it talks about God's love. Amen. I like to hear about how God loved me first. Oh, man, it's just all over. I seen Carolyn's life change when she started reading the Bible every night. And she got over there and started reading about how God loves her. And her voice got more tender. And she had more compassion in her. And it changed her life. That book will literally change your life. God will change your life if you just let him. God will change your life if you could just humble yourself and say, God, would you come in my heart and save me? Please. All it takes, please. That's the reason he said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, because they're not prideful. No, they don't, they don't have vainness in their heart. They just say, God, I love you. Would you save me? I want to go too, God. Would you save me? And God says, Well, yeah, it'd be my pleasure, man. That's what it's all about. That's the reason my son died on the cross, so I could save you. Well, sure. But us old people, I can't go down there. They'll, they'll think I'm terrible. I don't belong to this church. I don't have no right to go down there. I'm telling you what, when I go in Larry's church over there, I feel like I own this as much of it as you do because that's my father's house. It's not your church. It's not your preacher's church. It's my church and your church if you're born again. This is my father's house. I'm at home. I'm at home over there, Larry. I feel right at home. I know my father. I got saved, man. I got saved. I was telling you about when I drove by the old home place up there. I walked outside the door and I took a left. I didn't take a right. I took a left. And Mama sat down in that old metal rocking chair. And she said, come here, honey. And I was a big old boy, about nine, ten-year-old. About ten-year-old after Dad died of nine. And I sat down there and she led me to the Lord and I prayed and I got saved. Man, I got it all right there, buddy. I was so happy. I knew I got something that was lasting. Oh, it's good. But you got to ask him. You gotta get the pride out of your heart. That's the reason it's so easy for kids to come. Janet Jackson wrote a song and sung it. Says we're living in a world that we did not make. The group Poison wrote a song and says, "Give me something to believe in." And Mariah Carey wrote a song. There's got to be a way to unite this world. Amen. There's just got to be a way. Jesus said in John, "I am the way." I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father except by me. I'm the way. Come. Come, all you that are heavy and laden. And in the latter books of, of Revelation, it talks about coming. And he gives the last invitation. Come. Come. There might not be time. What about the preacher that died? What if he had been lost? Would he have time to call on the name of Jesus? A brain aneurysm, poof, and it's out and he's gone. Not a blink of an eye hardly. First Samuel talks about one heartbeat, and it's over. When I laid up at UT on that big old table, and they started burning that thing up in my heart, and I thought, oh, what if one little brain thing, I mean a little blood clot flicks off and goes in my brain. Bam! I'm gone, Daryl. Out of here. Right, check out. Right then. Don't have time. Say, oh, God, would you? Too late, and I drift off into hell. Is that what you want? Old guy said to the guy one time, what in hell do you want? And the old guy looked at him, he said, nothing. There's not a thing in hell I want. I don't want the torture, I don't want the flames, I don't want the agony, I don't want everybody running around screaming and hollering and cussing me because nobody's going to love you, nobody's going to have a time of day for you. They got enough problems on their mind without having to listen to you gripe and complain. But have you ever thought about the loneliness of being in hell? Oh, my God. I'm a, I'm a lonely person. It takes somebody being around me. I don't like to be myself. Never have. I like people who love me. It's the reason it feels so doggone good to share when you hug me and kiss me on the cheek. I know you love me. I know our relationship. I like a lot of friends. I like tenderness. I like to be loved. But there's no place that I get that I don't feel more love than when I get in the Holy Spirit with God and feel my Father's love. Amen. For in that city, there'll be many mansions. 
<laughs> I never lived in no mansion. I never walked on the streets of gold. I ain't ever had very much. I've been a poor boy all my life, just worked. But I'm blessed. I've got enough. Oh, my God, when I get to heaven, Jeff, <laughs> how I'm going to live. Because I'm an heir and a joint heir of the King of King and Lord of Lords. He's my daddy. Where it talks about being Abba, father. Dr. Raymond Smith told us up there at the preacher school, went through three years on Saturday. He said, you know, when you get right down to it technically in the Hebrew, there's not a word for Abba. Some people translate it as father, but he said the closest definition you could truly get to it would be daddy. And I'll tell you why. He said, when you speak of father, it's usually out of fear or respect. Father, out of respect. My, this is my father. But when you say daddy, that's a tender word. And Collins looks at you and he said, Papa, it's like saying, Daddy? Daddy? I love you, Daddy. That's a tenderness. That's what God wants, is that tenderness. He said, I'll be with you until the end of the world. I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I'll go all the way, all in. All in. Okay, say you get saved. And you're a Christian now. You have full rights to the throne. And uh, I got a watch. I can't even tell time. I'm going to get my time notes back out. Uh, you you with the. You've been saved. You, you've got it. You're you got all the rights to heaven. You can pray to the Father. You can come to church. You can rejoice. You can feel the God's Holy Spirit because He said. If I go away, I'll, I'll leave you the comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. It dwells in my heart. Man, you think I ain't got a Holy Spirit in me. Sometimes I feel like dancing. And, and I mean just, you know, we talking about Sunday school, running and shouting. I've seen Jim Millsap jump off this thing and run all over this place. Shouting and shouting and shouting and going crazy. And he does over there at the church where he preached on. But Jim's got something to shout about because God took him out of a beer joint, as I was telling you, Larry, up there in the first sermon he ever preacher right there on the streets in front of the beer joints, the guys he stole, served liquor to the week before he got saved. And when he got saved, God gave him something good enough to shout about and to run about and praise God about it. And if you don't like it, you just got trouble. That's all I can say. God done something spectacular in that boy's life, and he ain't ashamed of it. Especially the kids, and he run all over that First Baptist church over there, shouting, and they didn't know what to do with him. They looked around and said, that boy's got something real. And they started going up to him and said, well, what happened? He started telling them about how they got saved. Son, they was, half of them got right. He had something real. I go to UT and I don't have any trouble hollering, go Ross, go! I act like a fool. And they hadn't even been drinking. And they ain't ashamed to do it. And come out here and sit down and God bless us. Bless us real good today, God. <laughs> I'm a Christian. Oh, this, oh, God Almighty. People look what he's done for me. I don't be ashamed of it, Benny. Son, when he saved you, he gave you something. Brother, I've heard you shout. I've heard you. <laughs> I've heard you, Don. It does me good, son, when you shout and let me know that God done something real when he come in your life, brother. Hey, something to shout about, ain't you, brother? It's real. Our kids need to hear some shouting. They need to hear some amen. They need to see some tears and know it's real. Of course, we get plenty of the tears. That thing is stained all over the place in the tears. God's real, people. Okay, now you got saved. You're saved. You're a sinner. Let's go into some of the temptations. Bill, if you'll put up on the screen. I'd like to show you something that Frank preached one time. He preached uh, about a blurry palace. <laughs> That's a little bit blurry. He said that they was a palace. He said, I got saved, and I got in, God, in God's will, and he said, all of a sudden, Satan started to pull on that. He didn't grab me by the neck and said, I got you. He started to pull on that, just lightly. And that's the same thing he done for me, just lightly. He'd throw a poker game in front of me because he knew I loved to gamble. Five ball game, oh, if I seen a pool table, I knew what, what was going to happen. Papa was going to shoot some five ball. I'm not bragging, kids. I'm just telling you the fact what 
what's the devil done for me? This is part of my cheerleading part. The devil will put in front of you something that's luring. The Bible says there's fun in sin for a season, but then there's a payday, Lee. Bill. There's a payday. And the devil got me. And I started going and playing poker. And we drank a little bit. And I loved vodka cars. I could drink those things all night and see them seven. I love the taste of it. And I got involved in that. And then before long, the devil drugged me over this way and started smoking a little pot. And thank God I had enough sense to stay off of heroin back in those days and coke and stuff. Didn't have meth. Never did get real involved in drugs, but I'd smoke a little dope and get high. And the devil say, man, you're having, having a ball, ain't you? The devil will take you further than you want to go, and he'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and he'll cost you more than you want to pay. And that's what the devil did to me. He blinded me. He put sin in front of you. Whatever is the temptation in your heart, he'll put it there. And, he, and Frank talked about that Lucifer's palace that set way up on a hill, and the winding road went up to it. And, and I can just see the Budweiser signs and the country club signs and and all the beer signs and the party and the loud music blurring. And it's so tempting and so enticing. And I just, I just wanted to drive up there and just see what was in there. And, and, and I went up there and I noticed that there was four rooms when I got in there. And so I went into the first room. And they was drinking wine and some pretty girls sitting around and they were smoking cigars. It wasn't nothing real bad, but I knew I didn't belong there as a Christian. And God said, Doug... There's an exit right over there. You best be taking that exit. You don't belong in here. I saved you. You're mine. This is not no place for you. You don't need to drink wine and smoke cigars and run around with these loose women. Take the exit. But I thought this is not that bad. And about that time, the devil said, I don't want him going out that exit. I better do something. So he sent in a real pretty girl, cladly dressed, skimpily dressed, and she got me, and she said, let me show you the second room. And she led me gently to the second room. In that room, they was gambling. Loved to gamble. I'd get down on my knees out there at Reno and take them bones and roll them things back, put them against the wall, and rake in that pot. Oh, the devil make it look good to you. And I'd drink, and we'd sit back in that second room, and we'd drink that liquor, and I said, there's that old vodka Collins that tastes so good to me. And I'd start drinking. And the devil would say, that's good, ain't it? Oh, you're cool, man. And God would say, there's a, look, Doug, there's an exit sign over there. You need to just run on out. You don't belong in here. You're mine. Amen. I saved you, Doug. This is not right. And in my heart, I knew it wasn't right. I knew I didn't belong there. I didn't feel comfortable. But yet, I, I felt like I was cool. I was one of them. And the girl I was with was fogging all over me in the second room. But yet there was an exit sign, but I didn't take it. Pride kept me from taking that exit. I knew I needed to get out of there fast. But pride kept me in there trying to impress the people. Rolling bones. I got four queens. I'm sorry. I got a full house. I beat you. And they break in the thing. I think I'm still cool, man. I'm in the game. I should have took the exit sign. And then, in Lucifer's palace, a real pretty girl come up to me, and I'm talking about loosely clad, to be an understatement. She looked like she was going to a strip club, let alone a church house. In that third room, there was pole dancing, there was lap dancing, there was girls coming up and rubbing all over you and serving you drinks and saying, come on, honey, grab all the gusto you can grab. That's what the world's got for you. That's what you see on television every day. That's what's alluring. That's what the devil wants you to have. He'll lure you any place that the Holy Spirit's not at. And in these clubs, you'll find that kind of stuff. And God said, look, 
Look, there's your next sign, Doug. Get out of here quick. You need to run, Doug. Just run. Get out of here. And thank God, I went out the door. One girl grabbed me and said, go in the fourth room with me. Go in the fourth room. We'll stay all night. And God said, no, Doug. You're a Christian. You can't be a part of the world and a part of me. I'd rather you to be totally out of it than to be lukewarm. You can't play both sides. Hit the exit sign. Don't go in that fourth room. And I run out the door. And I turn to God. And I walk down the aisle. The First Baptist Church in Madisonville, the longest walk I ever took, sitting right back there on the very back with my mama. I was standing there and standing on that side, but when I took one step out, <coughs> the devil said, nobody's seen you do that. You can still get back in. They'll just think you bother. Just come on back in there. He's still trying to hang on, Colonel. He didn't want me to go because he knew if I went to God that he lost me and he didn't want that. He wanted my soul. He couldn't get that, but he wanted the rest of my life where I could tear everybody else down and not let them get to heaven. I'd be a stumbling block. I'd be an obstacle, a barrier in their life. He said, don't do it. Step back in there and get back in your place. There's still time. As I was going to God, the devil's still pulling me back. That's the power of the devil. He don't want you to know God and have a relationship. He don't want you to make a lasting and dying commitment, John. He don't want it. He wants you to be with him. And he'll do anything to grab you and get you out of there. That's what it's all about, friend. First, you must be born again and know Jesus Christ as your Father. He knew you before you were placed in your mother's womb. He loved you so much that he gave his life, his son. He gave his son, only begotten son. The only begotten son means a special, a special son. The Lord and God only knows how special he was. He loves you. He loves you so much. Oh, Jesus loves you so much that he gave his life that you may ask for forgiveness and be saved. And after being saved, going to church, being baptized, showing that you've died of your sin and rose to a new walk of faith, God. That's all it is, a testimony. I've died in my sin and through that liquid grave I've been raised to a new walk with God. I'm changed, as it talks about over in Psalms. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm changed. I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away, but oh, all things become new. I'd like to read you one more verse, and then we'll close. That verse is a very familiar verse, but I want to show you one thing in it. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in, the, in his name of, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, and thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I, oh God, please God, that part's in there where he said, and I, if I could have changed it, I would have made one thing different. I'd have put another, I'd have said even I, yes, oh God. That's the most beautiful part in there about me, he said, and, and, and I, even I, with all my sins that was in that cup, where'd it go? All that sin. And even I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. You're a sinner. But God still loves you. And there's room at the cross for one. There's room at the cross just for you. If you'll come. If you'll come and be with him. There's a, I'm hunting something if you want to know what I'm digging around for. They say the average man, in closing, the average man or the average woman 
is approximately, from the brain down to the heart, is approximately 18 inches. Right on there. 18 inches. On average, you know, if you put that right there, right there, most of the time you'll get 17, 17 and a half, 18, 18 and a half. It'll average out. 18 inches. I ain't got my glasses on, Sharon. I don't have my glasses done. <laughs> but that's what it is. But friends, if you never get it from your brain down to your heart, you'll never get saved. Amen. You've got to get it. The devil and his angels believe that there's God. Hitler was one of the, the most devout readers of the Bible there was. But he read it to prove, it, prove the Christians wrong. He never got it to his heart. And he went to hell because he never accepted Jesus Christ. By his testimony he went to hell. If you never give from your brain down to your heart, you'll never get saved. But I'll tell you what else. If you never get it from your brain down to your heart and let God take that red blood and cover your old black sins and make it white as snow. If you never get it from your brain down to your heart, you'll never make that lasting and dying commitment to let the Lord be, I mean, let Jesus be the Lord of your life. That's what will happen. You'll never do it. If you can't get it from your brain down to your heart, you'll never make that lasting and dying commitment. Just 18 inches. But my, oh my. Greatest 18 inches in all the world. As you stand and Sharon gets a song, God's calling somebody in here today I feel with all my heart. And he's saying, you've never been saved. You're not mine. And I want so bad for you to become my child. And all you've got to do is just simply walk down that aisle and put the pride out of your life and just come and say, Jesus, I want you to love me too. God, I believe what that old bald-headed ugly man said, that if I just asked him, you'd say, me too. Or would Jesus look at you on the last day and say, depart from me? For I never knew you. The most God awful word that will ever be spoken. Depart from me for I never knew you. I begged you to come. I wanted you to come. I did everything I knew to do. I gave my son for you. I even told you over in Revelation, come. Come, oh you the heavy laden and I'll, I'll give you rest. I put a new song in your mouth as it says in Psalms. It says it'll take me out of the Mary pit and out of the horrible clay and set your feet upon a rock and establish your going and put a new song in your mouth. That's what I can do for you. I can change you, but you've got to come. Come. Jesus is pleading, saying, come. I didn't give my son for nothing, man. That was a valuable gift I gave, and I let him bleed and die and separate, and I had to turn my back on him. Oh, where I could say, come. Your sins have been paid for and been bought. I'm offering you a free ticket. Would you come? Accept my day. You need to come today. You need to step out and come. There might not be another day in the rest of your life quite like this one. There might not be another moment in your life quite like this one when Jesus is calling. He's saying, surrender all, all in. And despite what everybody else is thinking, I'm not letting the devil drag me into hell. I'm coming, and I'm going to repent. There'll be people pray with you here. I'll guarantee you that. Just come. If God's saying, hey, I had you up at Rooster's Palace, I thought I had you. And God said, come. Get out of there. Get that exit. Come. Right here. Right here is where you need to come.